All right, so today I'm going to take a look at Rutherford's scattering experiment that he used to determine the nature of a nucleus inside an atom. So before we get started on actually looking at the experiment, let's take a look at what was known before he actually even did the experiment. So we we understand what the where they, where we were as a science community before the experiment, and then we can just see where we are afterwards and see like the impact of it. Okay, so first things first. First thing that they knew before the experiment, they'd already shown that an alpha charge was positive. So they knew that uh, radiation given off by a source of alpha radiation gave off positive charges. And they could have done this a number of ways. Maybe they tested it in a magnetic field or where something you looked at in Unit 4 where you saw that charges are affected in, in different ways by magnetic fields or several other experiments. So they already determined that alpha was positive, and that's an important fact that needed to be known. Next sort of thing was behind his Rutherford, sorry, Rutherford's choice of materials. There's a lot of people around think he used gold because gold is very unreactive or something along those lines because that's what you learn in chemistry, that gold's super unreactive. But that's actually not why gold was used. The key property that gold has is that it's incredibly ductile. And what that means is you can stretch it a lot and it still won't fracture. So it becomes really, 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 really thin but it still doesn't fracture, and it's that thinness that's important. Because as we know, alpha radiation has very, very low penetration. So if we're going to test this with a material, we need alpha, the alpha particles to be able to go through the material if they don't strike a nucleus. So we stretch it really, really thin, so that it's thin enough that the alpha can penetrate through it. So if it doesn't strike a nucleus, then that gives us a useful result. So we can see that it's either gone through or it's struck a nucleus. And that's why gold's chosen not to do with react, re reactivity of gold, which you'll have learned about in you know, some very low-level chemistry, how gold's bottom of your reactivity series and that sort of thing. All right, so let's move on to the actual experiment. Okay, so in the experiment, obviously they use the thin fil film of gold. But I'm going to look at a particular nucleus inside that, inside of that strip of gold. So what he'd have done in his experiment is he got a source of alpha radiation and probably surrounded it in some sort of lead box or like some metal box so that it, the radiation wasn't going out in lots of directions so it was only coming out in one direction. But even so, there's no way Rutherford would have been able to uh, have like one fine beam of alpha particles, which is not possible in those times. So what you'd have had is lots of almost parallel beams of these alpha particles and there I'm showing you the approach of five different ones from left to right. So let's take a look at what would happen to each of these particles, these paths shown. Now we don't know what the charge of the nucleus is at this point but we know that alpha particles are charged. So what you're going to see is an effect of that charge. So, let's start with the one on the top. Now, this one here is quite a distance away from your nucleus in the scale of things. It's not going to join up exactly because it's a bit difficult to do on here. So this part one here is really going to be influenced by the nucleus. So it's going to continue on its path and we will be able to detect it behind the gold film. So it will basically effectively go through the gold film or the gold ribbon, or whatever they want, the technical term you want to use for it. Uh, gold foil is most commonly used, I think, so I'm going to stick with that. So it's going to go straight through. And it's the same with this one here at the bottom, it's just an equal distance away. So it's just going to go straight through, it's not going to be affected, it's far enough away from the nucleus that the charge isn't really going to have an effect on it. So let's take the next ones in. So these ones here are going to come along they're not going to collide with the nucleus, but they are going to come quite close to the nucleus, okay? So what you will find is, I'm going to do the same for the bottom one. Ooh, that's gone a bit wiggly and gone up. That's, I meant to continue going in a straight line. Please don't draw it going up like that. That would be incorrect. So it's going to come along, 
they get quite close to the nucleus, so the charge of the nucleus is going to exert a force on your charged alpha particle, pushing it away. So this is what you're going to see in your experiment. You would find many more of your alpha particles appearing over here than directly behind where the nucleus is. And the super special case, which I'm going to look at in a little bit more detail, is this one that has a head-on collision. So its path comes straight here and then, whoa, goes back on itself. And amazingly, you can detect it from behind where you fired them from. That will be the maximum deflection angle. You'll get some which will deflect, deflect, uh, deflect through a smaller angle, but you'll get them bouncing back, which is how Rutherford was able to say, my charged particle has hit something in this material. There's something charged inside my material. Now, I haven't ionized it or anything, but there's already something charged inside there. And that was a really useful piece of information at the time. So what can we glean from this? Well, they already knew that the charge of an alpha particle was positive. So if this object inside atoms, which we didn't really know much about, was repelling it, as you can see from the second and fourth arrows down, that they were pushing it away, so they're repelling, that there must be a, an area of dense positive charge somewhere inside the foil here. Yeah? So... So we've got the, the, there's, a, there's an area of positive charge. Second thing to note is the majority of the alpha particles were, discovered, were detected behind the foil. So we're, we're talking in the high 90% of particles we were detecting behind here, which told us that the nucleus must be really, really, really small because you're getting such a high percentage going straight through unaffected, only relatively few are bent backwards and scattered and detected somewhere in this arc around here. And that was a very important discovery of Ruther like Rutherford. And I'm going to go on to have a look at this special case, the one which gets deflected backwards. So, one of the things we might, we might be interested to find out is how exactly how close does the alpha particle get before it bounces back? So in this, in this case here, we've had our alpha particle here, it comes in, and we've got it represented by this red positive charge here, and then it goes BAM, turns around and goes back the other way, so it flips 180 degrees and goes back the other way. So a key thing you can note is at this point here, the point where it turns around, you, obviously the alpha particle at this point will only have potential energy because if it's stopped and gone back it must have zero velocity at this point so it's maximum potential energy and the potential energy is given by this equation here which you learned about in unit 4 so we've got the potential energy is equal to the, the big charge to so the charge of your nucleus the smaller charge to so the charge of your alpha particle and then you've got your 4 pi you've got your permittivity of free space and obviously the radius in this case is the, dist the, dist the closest distance of it gets to the nucleus. And what you can say is that when you send your alpha particle in, you can measure the kinetic energy of your alpha particle going in. So what you can actually say is the kinetic energy going in will be, at the point where it turns around, equal to your potential energy. And that's quite a useful property. Because from that, we can identify, if we know what the velocity of the alpha particle going in was, we can equate that to the, basically the charge of your gold. So that's going to be the, the charge inside the nucleus. And as we see here at the bottom, the charge inside the nucleus is the number of protons, so the Z, times by the charge of a proton, which obviously we know is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. We're going to multiply it by the charge of your alpha particle, and that has two protons and two neutrons, so it's going to have um, two of those giving charge, so that's going to end up with your, the alpha, charge of your alpha particle is going to be two times the charge of a proton. So on the right hand side of your equation, you can have your charge of your alpha, and obviously we still have our 4 pi e0, 
and then we have this R which is the closest that the alpha particle can get to it so then if we rearrange that we can find out exactly how close our alpha particle has got to the nucleus before it was turned around which is a quite interesting thing to be able to find out.